All right. Um, so we're in Seattle. So here we're going to say good morning, everybody. Uh, it's cool to be here today. I am Julie Crittenden, and I manage um, basically oversee management of the sewer system in Seattle. Uh, and with me today is Caroline Barlow, who is our program manager for our rehabilitation program. And we want to talk to you today about our um, basically our path and strategic quest, so to speak. We we have a lot of Lord of the Rings references today. <laughs> Um, but basically how we got to a proactive rehabilitation program. So um, just where we were starting from walking into kind of this set of projects that Caroline's going to talk about. Um, we have a relatively old uh, sewer system. The median age of our pipes is, is just over 80 years old. Um, we are we have been in the past kind of more reactive than proactive around um, especially the rehabilitation of our pipes you know when your sewer system is younger you can get away with that maybe but uh, we're reaching the point where we we need to be more on top of it um, we also had a very um, asset by asset perspective um, and we're really looking at our system as a whole um, and obviously with increasing traffic in many of our larger cities um, working asset by asset and having our crews and contractors travel around the city a lot to do work and not grouping that work geographically was really inefficient. And so it was driving us to a place where, you know, we knew we needed to be increasing our rehabilitation work. We wanted to get ahead of, of what we expected in terms of an increasing deteriorating condition. Um, we also wanted to make better decisions, not just for individual assets, but also looking at our system more holistically and again, being more efficient in terms of using our crews and contractors time. So Caroline next is gonna get into talking about how we built all of this and, and how Info Asset Planner was one of our, our major foundational pillars. But um, I wanted to briefly go over some terms that you're gonna hear Caroline use in the presentation. Um, one is the term management areas. And this is a term that we use for a geographically grouped set of pipes that are hydrologically connected. You could also think of it as being a sewer shed. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about risk um, and probably everybody here knows, but that's basically the combination of a likelihood of failure and a consequence of failure. Uh, rehabilitation window. This is our predicted amount of time that remains before a pipe fails. Um, it's similar to the idea of a pipe's remaining useful life. Um, with those rehabilitation windows, we have a group of pipes that we consider high risk. And those pipes need to be rehabilitated within five years. And those pipes are ones that we consider to be in our backlog and ones that we need to actively be working on. Um, and then our last term is service equity. And that really is the equitable access to and outcomes from utility services. And considerations around equity could include criteria such as race, socioeconomic status, English fluency, and familiarity with and trust of government agencies. And, Caroline will talk a little bit about that later as well. So with that, I am going to uh, hand it over to Caroline. Thanks, Julie. Um, so what we wanted to cover today is basically our process and the steps we took to um, basically establish a more proactive program. Um, for our traditional you know, rehab process, we inspect our pipes, we assess risk, we identify work, um, we plan those projects and then we construct those projects. But we took some steps to help improve that process and how uh, we can be more efficient with, um, with our funding, but then also help tell our story of what our need is uh, for uh, future uh, forecasting. So the first step we took was to de develop a deliberate assessment strategy. Um, being able to really identify where we need to be within our system, um, and that really drives the the whole program. Uh, once we were able to assess our system, that helped us improve uh, the understanding of system risk, not just focusing on individual assets, but um, our system as a whole. Um, and then that we were able to forecast future condition and establish an investment strategy and use that information to tell the story and uh, present that to leadership to secure funding and resources, more specifically staff uh, resources uh, to help us implement uh, 
basically a capital portfolio. And then that um, also established a long-term schedule, not just you know one to two years, but looking out uh, 10 to 40 years in um, forecasting um, how we're gonna rehab our system. So the first step we're gonna talk about is our deliberate assessment strategy. Uh, so Julie had mentioned the, the management areas. Uh, so what we decided is that we couldn't, uh, this is such a large city that we needed to be able to uh, break it up into manageable areas. So instead of focusing on individual assets, we thought we would focus more on these management areas uh, to group similar pipes that are hydraulically connected and geographically connected um, so that we could kind of deploy crews uh, geographically. Um, this would help us with efficiency instead of them driving all over the city uh, to, um, to get gather information. And then it also kind of sets the structure for us to organize, plan, and report work, not just for our initial step of assessment, but uh, also for being able to uh, rehabilitate um, and complete construction projects. So what you see on the right is essentially uh, the 100 uh, management areas that we defined. Uh, and on average, we have about 14 miles per pipe uh, within uh, each management area. So once we establish that information uh, to help improve how um, we could inspect our assets, um, we basically established a, a schedule. Uh, you know, we knew we had to be really deliberate of where we were inspecting, um, you know, before we were very response driven, um, responding to calls or project needs and not necessarily looking at our system as a whole. Um, so we knew we needed to really define which management areas we were going to inspect and when we were going to inspect them. Um, our goal was to inspect our entire system within a 10 year cycle. Uh, which uh, was about an average of 140 miles per year. And then um, in order to initiate our inspection schedule, we looked at our management areas and basically prioritized them based on what we knew about risk. Um, you know, what was the average age? What was the condition of the typical condition of a certain pipe material? And uh, then we also looked at, you know, how complete were assessments within those management areas. Um, there were some areas where we had good data and had CCTV data within the past 10 years. Um, so we were able to identify those as kind of low hanging fruit and kind of button up those uh, management areas, get the inspections done and move on to uh, the next uh, management area that needed assessment. And then uh, the final lens was equity, being able to, you know, not just focus on maybe where we've gotten a lot of calls, but maybe look at where are areas where we may have not heard from customers because of um, you know, past uh, inequitable resources. So being able to apply equity to help prioritize that as well. Um, so we integrated the information from uh, the inspection uh, into our condition assessment. Um, when we first started the process in 2017, we had only inspected about 45, 46% of our system. Uh, today where we're at, we have um, completed about 84% um, and we're um, actively inspecting. We have a, a, a intent to wrap up inspections um, over 90% uh, in next year. And then uh, using that information really um, helped foster, you know, our um, pipe assessors and being able to establish a strategy uh, for themselves um, and, and develop work orders, essentially. Um, and uh, we did have to make some tweaks recently uh, to account for um, our 
new rehabilitation plan because uh, with the information that we've gathered to date, we've been able to define a schedule of how we're going to uh, go about and repair uh, the assets. Uh, and with some of that information, we're starting to see uh, some more elevated risk in other areas, and we've uh, adapted our equity lens as well. And so we had to move up some management areas in the schedule. Um, let's see, the next step is uh, now we have an improved understanding of risk within our system. In order for us to do that, uh, we needed to update our risk algorithm. We had um, another tool that wasn't working for us. It was essentially broken and we didn't have resources to uh, fix that tool. So we decided to adopt uh, Info Asset Planner uh, to uh, define risk within our system. Um, we had to work through a process where we defined um, our likelihood of failure and our consequence of failure. Um, and then uh, with the information that we put into Info Asset Planner, we were able to develop a risk matrix, matrix and define uh, rehab windows for our assets. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't advance. Um, so uh, what you see here on the right is essentially our algorithm within Info Asset Planner. Um, this is just a snapshot of a portion of our algorithm, but basically what we were able to do from our PSAP coding is define defects and uh, define actions for those defects to really populate what is the risk within our system and uh, provide forecasting on uh, what type of rehab methods um, we plan to do and how much we had to complete over you know, the next <laughs> 40 years essentially. So with uh, Info Asset Planner, um, we uh, used the algorithm, algorithm to calculate risk. And what was really helpful for us was that it was able to pull uh, data from three systems that we use daily, but don't necessarily work together. Uh, so we use uh, Granite uh, to uh, catalog all our um, CCTV data and PCP coding. Uh, we also use Maximo uh, to uh, log um, asset information and work order um, history, uh, both for maintenance and cleaning. Um, and then uh, we utilize ArcGIS to get the spatial information of, of our assets, but then also to identify, um, you know, potentially um, consequences of failure. Um, so the tool allowed us to bring in information from those different uh, uh, systems and help populate um, risk within our system. Um, and then we were able to develop basically a high level rehab action plan and cost projections with that information. And uh, here's just a snapshot of um, an asset uh, that incorporates uh, the information from our PCP coding showing where um, the defect is within a system. Um, and then it also helps us define like where we need to do a certain type of rehab action. So we talked a little bit about our likelihood of failure and consequence of failure. So, you know, really it's just looking at, you know, the asset itself, what's, you know, what's the issues with it? Is there clean, cleaning uh, that's occurring more than we would, than the ideal? Um, and then age and pipe material. And then we had, you know, all these external factors to define as consequence of failure. Are we gonna impact, um, you know, a, a large customer such as a hospital uh, and then being able to define um, a parameters around that in, in uh, Info Asset Planner. Um, once we ran the algorithm, uh, we were outputted with uh, this risk matrix and what we use this tool is to really define you know what's the worst of the worst of our pipes uh, up in this uh, red box here and uh, we worked with our um, assessment team to really define like a rehab window and it's synonymous to maybe like remaining use uh, 
a remaining useful life. Uh, but for us, it is how quickly can we get to this asset and how much time do we have to repair it, basically. Um, so what you see up in the right-hand corner is an example of you know, the worst pipe. And these are pipes that we need to fix right now. And we're going to do that um, as soon as they're identified. And we utilize either our crews or emergency uh, contracting. Pipes that were falling in the orange area was uh, pipes that are still operational for, for us, still flowing, not causing overflows, uh, but uh, we would not be able to rehab uh, until within, like we'd have to rehab within a one to five year period essentially, uh, because the amount of time it takes for us to contract work out, uh, going through the design process, permitting process, and then uh, bid an award, and then getting the contractor actually out there to repair. So we knew we needed to reduce and manage the pipes that were falling within this five year window. Um, and this, th the pipes that are falling in here is kind of that reactive mode to rehabilitating our system. And then those that are falling in the yellow and green, those are more long-term, um, you know, planning out further uh, where we see these pipes need to be rehabilitated in 10, 20 years. Um, so, uh, and identifying that, you know, there's opportunities maybe to do some proactive uh, rehab, uh, such as lining, but really for us, um, those were ones that were a little bit longer term and would be forecasted out um, in our rehabilitation strategy. So what does uh, that look like for our system as a whole? Um, so this is what, uh, this was a snapshot in 2019 from um, our risk uh, algorithm. And uh, we were showing, you know, this, um, graph essentially and when you compare the numbers it looks like it's not too bad you know how many pipes are within our one to five year period but at the current rate that we were rehabilitating and based on the funding that we currently had you know we were rehabilitating about five miles of pipe annually which means we wouldn't be able to address some of these pipes for up to 14 years and that really shows that um, you know, this this number, um, we were going to have pipe failures, you know, within the next 10 years or so. So we so we needed to do something differently uh, with uh, a, now understanding the risk within our system. Uh, so uh, we also took another look at our management areas, uh, took those results uh, that we did from the assessment and applied it to um, our management areas and really what we were able to do is rank uh, risk within our system and um, what you see on this map to the right is that those that are in the dark green those are the areas that have the most risk within our system um, so the the average miles of uh, high-risk pipes are you know averaging between 1.6 to 1.7 miles. And so these are areas that we knew we needed to prioritize uh, moving forward. So our next step in our process was to forecast uh, and secure future um, investments. And we really had to ask ourselves, you know, are we spending enough understanding the current condition of our system and how our uh, pipes are deteriorating over time and whether or not our current investment plan uh, was going to be reactive or proactive. So essentially what we did is we uh, developed um, several investment scenarios. Um, I'm just going to show you the ones that we um, are a good comparison of moving forward, but we had you know six to eight scenarios that uh, we uh, developed. And then uh, we noticed that any of our scenarios where it was really budget driven, like we kept a low budget, really were reactive. And so we, the ones that had the risk that drove the scenarios where we were focusing on a certain service level, uh, those were more of a proactive approach. So the first scenario that I'm going to share with you was what our current plan was, which was driven by um, budget. Um, 
when we ran uh, this forecast, uh, we had about a $20 million annual budget. And uh, what you can see uh, was in 2021 through 2023, essentially, we initially um, were planning on reducing our budget to accommodate for um, a larger project uh, that was being uh, completed by uh, SPU. Um, and what we saw was that our backlog increased considerably of our high-risk pipes. Um, so essentially what you see in the orange is uh, pipes that had less uh, than five years of rehab. And you can see how it just spikes up in those years that we reduced our funding. And then we wouldn't be able to reduce back down that backlog uh, until about, you know, 2020 20, uh, or 2056. And then the pipes that or the lines that you see in blue represents uh, pipes that have gone past their rehab windows. So like in this year, these may have been uh, pipes that were in the five year, but in 2020, um, they were at their six year mark. And so this just kind of continues to grow as we don't address these pipes that are within their five year rehab window. Um, the next scenario, oh, sorry, is our risk driven scenario. And we gradually increased, uh, recommending increasing our budget to 30 million annually by 2027, starting in 2020. 20 and getting rid of that dip in our funding. And we showed that uh, basically uh, we were able to be 10 years to a uh, proactive backlog. Um, so what you can see is that uh, right away, our backlog of five-year uh, high-risk pipes are going down and that um, we are constantly uh, addressing pipes that are in uh, the five year and those that were in the previous or past uh, the rehab window. Um, and you can see that we were able to do quite some more and uh, get that, that backlog down uh, in uh, 2030, essentially. So what really shows this better is when we compare the two scenarios. So you can see the first scenario that was budget driven, you know, we had about 130 miles of pipe by 2030 that were behind uh, the rehabilitation schedule, but we, you know, were able to get that down to 40 uh, miles. Um, and then the same with uh, those that were past their rehab window. So it is a drastic change. We were able to keep that under 10 miles um, annually. So with this information, uh, we presented this to uh, leadership through um, our strategic business, business plan uh, effort. We also got buy-in from our customer review panel, which are uh, local customers to SPU. Um, that, um, to be honest, we really didn't have a lot of like questions. I think there's a lot of support for us to move forward with this certain uh, uh, service level. And so we were able to secure funding. Uh, along with this exercise, we also uh, identified, you know, if we're asking for more money, we need people to help staff and uh, deliver this work. And so part of that ask, we were able to secure uh, four additional FTEs. Um, and then uh, we gained uh, programmatic governance um, to uh, deliver uh, this portfolio. So not just um, planning leadership, but then also those that um, uh, within our team provide delivery, develop the um, contracts and um, and do the design work uh, bought into this uh, portfolio as well. And we were able to basically not just secure the funding for the, the short term, but also forecasted a long term capital budget through 2050. So our final step, I think, <laughs> is our uh, establishing our long-term schedule. Um, so we knew we needed to 
um, address our high risk pipes and move towards a more proactive uh, management of our portfolio. Um, and then using the management areas, um, we defined uh, basically uh, where the highest risk was within our system. Um, and then we also looked at um, whether or not we are providing an equitable service. Um, and so using our investment targets as our baseline, uh, we were able to factor uh, this information into um, a plan essentially to deliver um, contracted and crew work. Um, so I showed you this map earlier, but basically we took these results um, and we ranked the management areas. Um, and then I have mentioned the, the equity, and this is um, basically a map of, um, of different socioeconomic uh, race, uh, language, um, and health to help define what were areas that were um, least resilient to um, to a sewer backup. So we, what we recognize is that uh, when a sewer backup happens, uh, it's very costly and uh, time consuming. And those that are facing inequity um, have a harder time uh, bouncing back from that. So it was just really, uh, we wanted to define where there were areas that uh, we had uh, uh, customers that may be disproportionately affected uh, because of inequities. And so what we were able to do is with this information from um, our uh, racial and equity index, uh, we made a composite um, map, which is what you see here on the right to really show what were the areas that were least resilient uh, to um, something happening to their service. And what we did was take both our system risk and our service equity information, and uh, we did a composite of these two maps to basically identify um, how we wanted to prioritize uh, rehabilitation within our system and really identify, you know, where are the first management areas that we were gonna go to uh, with our rehabilitation uh, strategy. And what you see here is basically phase one of our uh, rehab strategy. And this is you know, delivering capital projects, essentially. And what you see in the green is basically the areas that we um, are gonna be repairing for that given year. Um, and these are addressing only high risk pipes. And um, what you see in the gray is basically the risk still. Um, and then in the red outline, those are the areas that we identified as the least resilient uh, management areas. And what is nice about these graphics is what you can see is as we move throughout this, the city in the green areas, you can see that risk is going down as we go over um, time. So you kind of see how they fade from maybe like a darker color to like a lighter gray showing that risk is going down. So ultimately, you know, we want to get away from these dark gray areas to more of a, a lighter gray as we uh, implement our rehabilitation strategy. And then for our long-term forecasting, uh, this is kind of a similar figure where you kind of see us moving throughout the city and risk going down over time. So, um, what was the outcome of our quest? Uh, we basically were able to um, develop a 40-year rehabilitation schedule that balances risk, equity, and cost. Um, we were able to um, move from being reactive to a more proactive position with our um, you know, assessment strategy and rehabilitation strategies. And then we were able to secure uh, funding uh, for the current six years, but then also have a trajectory for the next 40 years. 
And uh, this whole process was not an easy process. It was um, a, com a culmination or compilation of several initiatives through our uh, capacity management and operations and maintenance program. Um, and it really uh, allowed us to illustrate to uh, regulators that our commitment to rebuilding our system, um, because uh, we do have a consent decree from uh, Ecology. So um, with that, uh, we do want to thank uh, the folks that helped support, deliver uh, this program. Uh, we had uh, Blue Cypress Consulting and Innovise has definitely been a big part, and then EMA. Um, and that, uh, questions. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Caroline. And I, I put in the chat, I always forget to mention this, but uh, all, all, the, all our presenters did allow for their slides to be PDF. So if you look in the handout section of GoToWebinar, you can download that and kind of follow along uh, with all the presentations and have that uh, as well. Um, yeah, we had a question come in uh, from Megan, who I, I've talked to down in Texas, actually. Uh, she says, excellent presentation, Caroline, Julie. Uh, did Seattle collect the data for identifying lower resilience areas from internal departments, or did they use uh, data from the uh, Census Bureau? I think when it came to that equity question, I think that's what she's getting at. I think we have an internal department that, um, I think I noted that on that slide, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming they get some information from Sensei. I, I don't know where they compile the information specifically, but I'm assuming that it is um, derived from census information. Yeah, that's awesome. There's something internal. I know too, there's uh, a social equity kind of layer, actually you can get from ArcGIS Online uh, that's created and published by the CDC that has very similar uh, kind of statistics in there as well. So, um, that's definitely accessible data that's pretty useful for questions like this. Um, yeah, awesome. Uh, I loved seeing the, um, yeah, we've heard that a lot with InfoAsset Planner. It's a great tool for being able to justify kind of what you want to accomplish long term. We've heard that from utilities kind of big and small. So that's great to see that that was the outcome after. I think we were, I mean, the initial training with Martha and I kind of happened November 2018. So it's definitely <laughs> been, it's definitely been a journey. So happy to uh, see this presentation and, and some of the results from this. Yes, it's it's been very helpful to tell our story. And um, I think it, what's nice about it is that it's very, I guess, telling of our system. And, and it's not just kind of like this pie in the sky. It's been able to, you know, get buy-in from our leadership. So. Absolutely. Perfect. 